but that won't be the end of the exponential growth of computing. We'll go to the sixth paradigm, which is computing in three dimensions. Chips today are already very dense, but they're flat. We live in a three-dimensional world. We might as well use the third dimension. Our, th our brain is organized in three dimensions, although it uses a very cumbersome and slow information processing method. It sends messages using chemical signals that travel a few hundred feet per second. That's a million times slower than electronics. It does its computing in the interneural connections at about 200 calculations per second. That's a million times slower than, than today's computation. But it's organized in three dimensions. It's massively parallel. We have 100 trillion of those connections. So we have 100 trillion things going on uh, at the same time. And that's the direction we will go in with our computation. And when I said that in my 1999 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, that was then considered a controversial notion. Today, that's very much a mainstream view. If you speak to the Intel scientists, they say, well, we already have three-dimensional self-organizing molecular circuits working. The, these will be in production in the teen years, well before we run out of steam uh, with these flat integrated circuits. And you'll notice that's not a straight line from this logarithmic graph. We have exponential growth in the rate of exponential growth. It took us three years to double the price performance of computing in 1900, two years in the middle of the century, we're now doubling it every year. Well, it was actually doubling it every year as of the year 2000, it's now every 11 months. So this acceleration with the rate of acceleration. Supercomputers marching along. This is a graph in my book. Now, I mentioned that my predictions are considered daunting when I make them, but they end up being overly conservative. The speed at which that happens seems to be accelerating because this graph predicts that in 2013, supercomputers will hit 10 of the 16th, 10 million billion calculations per second. That's a significant threshold because that's the amount of computation required to simulate all several hundred regions of the human brain, and according to the most conservative estimates. And I have four different ways of analyzing that in chapter three. The most conservative is 10 of the 16th. Well, six weeks after the book came out, Japan announced two supercomputer projects to hit that level in 2010. But there's been clear exponential growth in supercomputing. And I don't want to dwell on these examples of electronics, but, but look at this chart here. This is the cost of a transistor. So when I was growing up in Queens, New York, I would hang out at the surplus electronic shops on Canal Street in Manhattan, which are still there. And I'd buy something about this big, this is early 60s, that was a telephone relay with support circuitry, equivalent to one transistor, only a lot slower, for about $40. Come 1968, you could buy a whole transistor faster than my relay for only one dollar. In 2002, you could buy 10 million. Today, it's 100 million, and they're a lot faster. And you've probably heard these fantastic comparisons of how far electronics has come. But what's really interesting about this graph is how smooth the, tra the trajectory is. I mean, it looks like the output of some tabletop experiment. But this is the measure of the innovation, the ideas, the productivity, the invention of millions of people and thousands of companies and dozens of countries with all kinds of vagaries of human history. There's been wars and recessions and IPOs and bankruptcies and competing marketing programs. You would think that maybe there'd be a general trend line, but it would be very erratic from year to year. It's a very smooth, very predictable curve. And as I say, I've been making forward-looking predictions based on these kinds of models for, for about 30 years. And unlike Gertrude Stein's roses, it's not the case that a transistor is a transistor. As we've made them cheaper, they're actually better because they're smaller. And they're, the electrons have less distance to travel, so they're faster. Smooth exponential growth in the speed. And so the cost of a transistor cycle has come down by half every 1.1 year. If you add other types of innovation in electronics, we have a doubling of price performance of electronics every year. That's basically 50% deflation for, it, for electronics of every kind of electronic. It also it happens to be the case that we have 50% deflation in, in every type of information technology. The cost of databases, whether it's genetic data or brain data, uh, the cost of software, the cost of software productivity, it's all has approximately a 50% deflation rate. And depending on what week it is, the economists will worry about inflation or deflation. I think the Fed and Bernanke are back on inflation. But they'll say that deflation is a bad thing too. We had massive deflation in the depression. And eventually, uh, within let's say it's in 20 years, uh, virtually all the economy will be information technology. 
So the economists would say, well, if you can get the same capability, the same stuff a year later for half the money, that's going to lead to a shrinking of the economy, particularly when most of the economy is information technology. Because people will increase their consumption somewhat, but they're not going to double their consumption every year, year after year, to keep up with this 50% deflation rate. So the size of the economy in constant dollars will shrink, and that's a bad thing. That's actually not what we find. We find that the growth of information technology, whether it's electronics or databases, more than doubles every year. We've had 18% per year growth in constant dollars for the last 50 years in information technology, despite the fact that you can get twice as much capability each year for the same amount of money. As the price performance reaches new levels, new applications explode on the landscape. People didn't buy iPods for $10,000 10 years ago, which is what it would have cost. So when price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications become feasible. Social networks weren't feasible three years ago. Search engines weren't feasible five years ago, and so on. Magnetic data storage, I just put that up because it's another random example. We have hundreds of these. This is not Moore's Law. Nobody talks about the equivalent of Moore's Law for magnetic data storage, but we see the same exponential progression. And I mentioned the biotechnology revolution. This is really a profound revolution. It's progressing exponentially now that we can actually reprogram biological processes using these, these new tools which are emerging. RNA interference just emerged three years ago. So the history we've had to date in biology and medicine is not a good indicator of what will be feasible because biology and medicine, by and large, drug development, which was drug discovery, was not an information process. It was really just hit or miss, happening to find something. But now we have these tools that are growing exponentially in power. I gave a presentation two weeks ago to the directors of the National Institutes of Health and their chief scientists. And they showed me these databases they're creating, which are really pretty phenomenal. They're doubling in size every year uh, of not only genetic data, but proteomic data, being able to take genes and actually visualize them in three dimensions, predict their interactions with other proteins, to be able to really design at the genetic level very sophisticated interventions, and all of this is gearing up exponentially. It costs ten dollars for base pair to sequence DNA in 1990. Uh, it's a penny today. This slope on this logarithmic graph represents doubling the amount of genetic data each year. This is continued. The first genome cost about two billion dollars to collect. Uh, we're now down to it's under ten thousand dollars. It'll be a thousand dollars within a couple of years. Uh, NIH is now collecting a million genomes so they can relate genes to disease states and make very powerful predictions as to uh, how different diseases are personalized in your genes. And all of this is scaling up exponentially. It'll be a very different world uh, ten or fifteen years from now. Communication uh, is growing exponentially. This is a very democratizing technology. In my book, Age of Intelligent Machines, which I wrote in the 1980s, I predicted that the Soviet Union, which was then going strong, would ultimately be wiped away through this emerging decentralized electronic communication. Because the whole paradigm of the totalitarian state was to grab the centralized TV and radio station and keep everybody in the dark. And that's exactly what we saw in 1991 in the school against Gorbachev. It wasn't Yeltsin bravely standing in a tank that swept away that coup although that was the photo op. It was really this decentralized uh, communication network of email using uh, primitive teletype machines and early fax machines. Everybody was kept in the know. The, the authorities came in and grabbed the TV station and it didn't make any difference. And totalitarian control was really swept away. That didn't make a good photo op, but that was the reality. And we actually have seen a, a broad movement for the last 20 years of, of democracy. If you go back 25 years, there are actually relatively few democracies in the world. There are some notable holdouts, but uh, this has been a very democratizing technology. And not just at the political level. You know, patients are going to their doctors, and if they have a chronic disease, they're in touch with people around the world. They know all the new treatments, all the, all the results of, of trials, and they'll know more about that disease than the doctor does because they're focused on that one condition. This is that graph I had in the 1980s. Well, I had just a little piece of it, the left-hand side of it. Uh, I saw the ARPANET doubling every year and uh, predicted that 